Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to episode six. Welcome. Thank you for joining me on another one of these. Uh, first of all, as always, thank you everyone for the support on the previous episodes. I really appreciate it. It doesn't seem to be stopping. You guys are with me all the way. So uh, I really appreciate it. I just want to say thanks, first of all, before I get into the episode today. I want to start today with that little jam, if you like. Um, I've had this song in my head for a couple of days now. That was a little take on an Alexander O'Neill track. He was a great, great soul singer in the 80s. Um, very underrated, I think. If you want to talk about underrated singers, I think he's up there. Um, There's a track called If You Were Here Tonight. And it's just this really hypnotic little groove. A lot of bands of the 80s did this as well, very effectively, obviously not necessarily with guitar, but um, I just absolutely adore that little sequence. It's, it's really basic, it's like an E to an F sharp over a D. C to a D. It's the kind of thing you just listen to for hours, at least I could, and um, I just thought I'd have a little play over it because it's one of those really, you know, you hear the vocals on that track, they're incredibly expressive, it's that whole classic 80s soul singer thing, and I thought why not apply that to guitar, and it got me thinking about the dynamics of guitar playing. And um, you know why some of my favourite players play the way they do is is largely to do with dynamics. I've touched on this before in previous videos, but it's really exaggerated with a little loop like that. Especially when you are looping, because you've got that solid backing underneath you, you're free to just express lead lines and little single note runs in any way you please. So, you know, on that subject, it got me thinking about players. You know, most notably players like John Mayer, I guess. And I'm going to talk more about Mayer in the future because it's such a huge part of the guitar world 
it's at least my guitar world, and I think for a lot of other guitar players as well. At the moment, John Mayer is kind of definitely one of the leading uh, proponents of really expressive, dynamic guitar playing. So I'll talk more about him in the future, but it did get me thinking a bit about him and some of those little lines I was doing, you know, strap style guitar with a middle pickup. It's a very, it's a very vocal like little vibrato that, that Mayer has and he, I guess he's got it from players like Clapton as well. You know, you kind of get more guitar focused vibrato, which would be stuff like But the way Mayer plays is a little bit more vocal than that. It's the little slurry on those. It's hard to kind of quantify and put into words, but when you hear it, you know it's it's a Mayerism or a BB Kingism. It's that kind of thing. Works very well with that kind of little jam I did. Um, it also got me thinking on the subject of sort of dynamics about. One of my best guitar playing stories, which I, I thought I'd tell quickly. Um, back in, I think it was 2010, and I had befriended a couple of um, musicians who, who had happened to know and had some connections to Clapton and Beck and that kind of circle, which I was very, at the time, I was 14, that was really exciting, and one of them offered me the chance he was roadieing for Clapton at the time, a um, chap by the name of Ravi, and he got me tickets to go and see... Clapton and Beck, they were doing a double-headed kind of tour at the O2 in London, and I was really, really excited. And at the time, I'd kind of grown up with Clapton, and um, I'd, I'd kind of become a little bit, not disillusioned, but just, I wasn't that necessarily interested in quote-unquote blues guitar playing. At the time, I was more into, I was really getting into Beck, and that kind of expressive, um, quirky, jazz fusion-y, I guess you could term it, instrumental stuff. So I went really with the premise of going to see Beck and really being enthralled by the prospect of that. And like I said, I was 14 at the time. Beck played his set first of all, and it was it was fantastic. He had an amazing band. I think it was Rhonda Smith on bass at the time, and and a few other notable names. And it was really great. But I think just being that age, a lot of it just went over my head, and it's stuff that I would come later to appreciate about Jeff Beck's playing. His, um, his intricacies, and plus when you're in an arena, a lot of that stuff does get lost in translation anyway. It's such a huge venue, the nuances of what Jeff does, maybe they just weren't quite translating to me anyway. So I had a great time with that, and I, then I thought, okay, here comes, here comes Clapton's set, and it was the time when uh, he'd grown his hair long again, and I think the, out, the eponymous album Clapton had just come out, and it was all kind of really rootsy, 30s and 40s style, not even blues, it was really sort of, um, I guess just old, folky kind of song. I don't know how to describe that album really. It's a great album, but at the time it was kind of like, okay, now it's time for Clapton's set and then it's time to go home. And anyway, I got through um, and I remember there was one track that Clapton played. He just did a, a rendition of I Shot the Sheriff. So, you know, most guitar players know that, tr that, that track. Most musicians have played that track, I'm sure, in cover bands and stuff. I thought, okay, here we go, and um, the way he played it, and he did this huge breakdown solo in the middle, which I'd never heard before, and, you know, anyone who knows that track will know, it's a very, very simple reggae-ish kind of... And anyway, he was playing over the breakdown. down to this kind of a level and then there would just be these that was one little lick I remember stealing from him that night little flurries um, and it just it blew me away and it stuck with me and I remember going straight onto YouTube when I got home or the following day or something and just obsessing over finding that song from that gig 
and it was unique. It was something I'd never heard from him before. Obviously, Clapton is kind of, he's well known for certain styles, but there's little moments that he just blows you away, and that was one of them for me. So it was an interesting little story, and it made me really focus on dynamics from that point, because like I said, it was so uh, loud and soft and so drastically just inviting. It really kind of enveloped you, and I uh, just really was taken with that moment, and that kind of set me on a path, I think, for more dynamic guitar playing, if you want to call it that. So despite my adoration and endless love for Jeff Beck, that night was Clapton's night for me. And I've since seen both of them, and they both had completely overwhelming moments in their own subsequent gigs, usually when they're by themselves. Like I say, sometimes these nuances just go unnoticed sometimes, but in the right context, in the right element, and at that particular time, just Clapton with a Strat straight into a Tweed Twin, that was the voice of the guitar that spoke that night, I felt. So I'll link it below, actually. I'll see if I can find it on YouTube and um, and link that particular live track below. I'm sure some of you would, would get a kick out of seeing that. So anyway, that's my little, my little Clapton story. I thought I'd share that today on the subject of dynamic playing. While I'm also playing with this sound, I thought I'd just do a little focus on gear because I seem to get a lot of gear questions. I appreciate all the playing questions, playing related questions I get, and that's what I'm trying to veer this channel more towards, but there's a lot of people want to know about gear at the same time, and I'm, I'm happy to talk about that. Um, very quickly, you know, the sound I was just playing with, I've got the Boogie Fillmore amp today, and I'm using my Sir Classic Pro um, for that classic stratty thing, middle pickup. <laughs> As you'll probably have been able to tell from the intro and my reference to Alexander and Neil, I'm a huge fan for those, a fan of those like real, I don't know whether you'd call them cheesy or what, but just those, those great 80s sounds, um, you know, smothered in chorus and stuff like that. And as long as it's done tastefully, I think there's good cause to use it, particularly if you're going for those airy kind of atmospheric sounds. And um, something I, I do use chorus quite a lot. It's one of my favorite modulation effects. It's pretty much one of the only ones I use regularly. Chorus and, and phase shifting. The chorus on my board, I haven't talked about it before really, but it's an analog man by chorus and it took me a long while to find one. Um, and when I did, I was just like, okay, that's the perfect chorus for me. I, I love it so much. You can use chorus in a number of different ways. And when it's a really nice analog unit like this, it's amazing what it does to the sound. It's not just an effect. It becomes an integral part of the tone. And I think that's what a lot of players recognize if they use those old 70s and 80s analog choruses. Let me give you an example. You know, I had the um, clean sound of the amp. I do have some delay from the timeline. So here's just the dry sound. And then I put the chorus on. Actually, I mean, I love using this as well for the um, the faster Leslie type thing. But just in that default slower mode, it sounds it sounds great. And generally, my go-to if ever I'm playing those kind of real expressive, fairly dynamic single note stuff. I like to have a little bit of chorus in there because it really fattens up those single notes and that can be hard to achieve sometimes if you're playing with your fingertips, you're playing very soft. It, the chorus really helps, I think, just to bring out a certain element that you wouldn't get just without it. So have an experiment with chorus or analogue style chorus. If you want to play in that kind of expressive way, and I guess people achieve that through different means. You know, some some guys like to use modulated delay, so that the chorus is only on the repeats. Other people like to have it more pronounced. I do like to have it more pronounced, just because I think I love that warble. I don't have it set particularly warbly, but if I do turn it up a bit, you'll hear it more. <laughs> I love that sound. So guys, play with some chorus if you can, uh, if you feel so inclined, because I think it really does add a level of 
emotion to your playing, if that's what you're going for. So that's a bit of cool gear for today. I will talk more about gear in the future, but chorus. Use it or lose it, because it's it's never going to go away, but it has been neglected more recently in, in the guitar world, so bring it back. Um, last thing I want to do today is just address one of the questions I got from Andrew Reynolds. He asked, what volume do you have in the room when playing alone? And can you get a good sound from your amps at low volume? Um, typically, I always try and play as loud as I can if I'm at home. It depends on how many people are in the house. Today I'm not playing really loud, but if I play full tilt, and obviously I've been playing very softly, so if I was just to play the boogie full tilt, it's quite loud, it's still not loud enough to overshadow the pick noise, I'm sure you can still hear a bit of that, but it depends on what you want to play. If you're just playing balls out rocky stuff, as it were, and you really want to lay into the guitar, then you kind of have to be a bit more respectful of noise, you have to attenuate if you've got a loud amp. I do use the Boss Waza Tube Amp Expander, I've been using that recently, I love that. That really helps to, particularly with the Zs, to tame those down because they sound better the more you turn them up. But there is cause, I think, to not use an attenuator and to use a loud amp. And I think that, on the subject of this dynamic playing exercise, if you can turn your amp up really loud and just play as softly as you can, that's a totally different experience to playing an amp that would otherwise be loud, playing loud and using the amp at quieter volume, if that makes sense. So you've got two schools of thought there. You can either play loud on the guitar and turn your amp down, and that gives you more of a squished sound. It sounds a little bit more um, um, aggressive, I guess, and it sounds more intense. But equally, you can flip it around and play a lot more quietly on the guitar. You know, use this thing, volume control, and um, and have the amp really loud, and then when you're ready for it to do so, the amp really blooms and really speaks. So like I said, the amp's not that loud today, and I'm using a little bit of overdrive from the King Tone Duelist, but it just means that when I play soft, it's not it's not compressing as if as if the amp was loud and I turned it down with an attenuator or something. It's not compressing, so then when I do lay into it... So really, it depends on what sound you're going for, and it depends on what approach you want to take to playing. Just have a play around. If you can, turn your amp up and just play softly. Equally, it's a lot of fun to play really hard and kind of attenuate the amp if that's the that's the approach you want to take as well. So it's just a matter of context as all things are. Hopefully that kind of answers the question. Um, I just try and play as loud as I can, but if I can't, I do that. I just turn the guitar volume down and play softly. So it's all a matter of experimentation. Anyway, that's enough for today. Thank you very much for joining me for episode six. I'm gonna do episode seven as soon as I possibly can. So keep those questions coming in. I want to address them. Um, as many of them as I can in the in the next videos I do so keep them coming in. Thanks for the support Have a great day guys. Take care of yourselves, and I'll see you next time. Bye. Bye